You know, when you look at the sky and you see birds and you see stars, you know, you're always attracted to the, the different perspective, I think, that that offers. I think that's what attracts people to flight. I've just always been interested in planes. My mom tells me that when I was younger, I'd wake up early before school and uh, watch the movie Top Gun, but I would actually fast forward every part of the movie that didn't have a plane in it. So once I got here and actually found out that I could do this stuff and work with the planes, you know, it was just kind of a given that uh, I was just going to do it. At the University of Kentucky, students and faculty, researchers, are looking into problems that are at the state of the art in, in the research into flight. Flight is such a broad area of research and there's so much yet to be discovered. Everyone who works on these problems brings a different perspective and because of that, research is always full of possibilities. You can only learn so much in a classroom. By bringing those students out of that classroom and into the lab, they actually get to um, it goes back to the creative process where they're actually building something. They're getting that, that extra hands-on learning experience and it tends to cement sort of what they're learning in the classroom. For their senior design project, the students are building and designing an unmanned sensor vehicle to support my research. Uh, so these UAVs are, are going to be used to measure atmospheric turbulence near the ground. Uh, this sort of data will help us to better understand how surface and atmospheric conditions produce turbulence. And ultimately, this, this, this information, this understanding, will then be used to produce better climate and weather models. And we can even use it to better improve the safety of takeoffs and landings around airports in bad weather. My name's Scott Ashcraft. I'm a mechanical engineer here at UK. And I'm also the team lead for a senior design project that works out of this lab uh, called the Blue Cat Project. My name is uh, Michael Thaman. I'm a graduate student here at UK in the Mechanical Engineering Department, and I'm a researcher in the UAV lab. At the moment, you know, the only way this lab survives is by passing on information. One of my job description title things is that I have to, you know, teach Scott and teach Sam, who's the other undergrad that works for us, you know, try and teach them everything I know. You don't want to have any brush marks in it, um, so you want everything thick and smooth and so just keep reiterating yourself, thick and smooth, thick and smooth, thick and smooth. The Blue Cat Project, you know, uh, what Dr. Bailey needs to conduct his research is, you know, a plane that can fly as fast as possible, as close to 100 miles an hour as possible, and then fly as close to the ground as possible. And, you know, he wants to do this for an hour, uh, take as much data as he can. With the UAV, what you can do is you can go out, you can fly, and you can capture. Within a short period of time, you can capture a lot of data. The motivation for doing research is just, it's always fun to do something new that nobody else has done before. Research is basically just the, the quest for scientific understanding. It's, um, it's finding the pieces to a, a broader puzzle. First you have to find the piece and then you have to fit it into the puzzle and, and ultimately you want to step back and take a look and see what the puzzle, the picture of the puzzle is, is showing. The faculty and students really work together as peers in, in a lot of circumstances to plan and conduct the research. They begin maybe as a student not understanding as much, but they become a peer and they learn to love it from someone who's already loved it before them. In high school, I actually wanted to be an architect. And uh, as I went through the application process to become an architect, I realized that the parts of architecture I really liked were actually the engineering aspects. Uh, so I applied to engineering schools. And all of a sudden I was exposed to this world of labs and lasers and wind tunnels. I really enjoyed my master's, so then I went and I did a PhD because that was, my master's was a lot of fun. And when I was done my PhD, I was uh, still looking for more ways that I can, I can continue this enjoyment. That morphed into uh, finding a faculty position. If we take a bundle of those lines, basically if we draw a circle around a bunch here and we encompass those lines all together that becomes 
of our Vortex tube. So it's always the same set of lines at all times. Uh, I'm Mark Miller. I'm a second year master's student here at the University of Kentucky. Um, I'm working down in the fluid mechanics lab studying turbulent boundary layers and turbulent interactions with roughness. Well, turbulence is probably familiar to most people, uh, although they might not be aware of it. If you, if you mention turbulence, generally they think airplanes, bumpy flows, uh, the airplane bouncing around. Uh, but also if you think of a rushing river, the kind of chaotic, random, unsteady, rotational motion that's involved, all those eddies and swirls and, and random motions. Turbulent flow is difficult to understand because it's, it's full of all different kinds of things. When you're in a plane and you're hit by turbulence, what's actually happening is the plane is being buffeted by eddies, different sizes, which causes different vibrations in the plane. It's been an ongoing dilemma that people have still not been able to solve even over a hundred plus years. The fun part about turbulence is that there's so many questions. Lack of full, complete understanding of what's going on and there's so many different complex uh, interactions that are involved in, in, in this problem. Roughness is one of the things that causes turbulence. And we, we can actually simulate that in a tunnel with our rough surface and the rough surface has tiny little cracks in it. We can actually inject air into that flow. So you have this turbulent flow coming in, we inject air in and then see how all those eddies and all those the different components of velocity interact. I had Dr. Bailey from my undergraduate fluids class and he actually, after class one day I mentioned, I was like, do you have any way I could work down in the fluids lab? Because I, I saw wind tunnels and like anybody else thought they were pretty cool. And uh, just like, eh, I could do that. So he actually offered me a, a part-time job as an undergraduate to work down here paid. So that was awesome. It's my job to help a student become a, a better scientist, a better uh, learner, a better educator, uh, a better researcher and a better worker, and ultimately just to, to train these people to, to become the next generation of scientists. Today, you know, it's been a while since I've been, we've been out to the field and been flying, um, so I'm just gonna be taking some of the trainer planes, you know. I'm uh, just gonna be, you know, going out flying, having some fun and practicing, and, you know, I've been in the lab working, so it's going to be a good break just to get outside and get flying again. I'm telling all the Blue Cat people, like, I'm going to be scared out of my mind to fly this thing for the first time. And, you know, will it crash? We have all the models, we do all the simulation we can, but it's just, it's hard to predict what's going to happen and how the plane's going to respond. Um, when it comes down to it, it's all worth it in the end when, you, when it does fly and does do what it's supposed to. I think people have a natural curiosity to problem solve. And, and part of solving the problem comes from understanding. In order to build a taller tower of blocks, you have to understand how they fit together. But it turns out that research and advancement in research is really solving a set of small problems. And you take each problem in turn and you answer that, and then the next problem and the next problem, and all of those added together, not only the work you're doing, but the work that everyone else is doing, becomes then an advancement to the body of knowledge and, and the result of research. My name is Michael Siegler. I'm an assistant professor of mechanical engineering at the University of Kentucky. In engineering, we're usually trying to develop something. We have a specific problem that we want to solve. I try to work on the simplest problem that I can, that I can come up with that I think represents, you know, at least approximately the problem I'm, try I'm trying to solve. This shows that the, the nanowires can have an effect. My name is John Calhoun and I'm finishing up my uh, second year of grad school uh, here at the University of Kentucky. The project I'm doing is, uh, its ultimate goal is research into drag reduction on a surface. You need to have specific motions to reduce drag. One way 
that we're looking at doing it is to use uh, these, these nano wires. So this, these would be uh, wires which are grown on the surface of the bounding wall. So these nano wires are, are active. So if you apply a voltage to them, you can move them back and forth. If you can actuate them correctly, this gives you the appropriate motion you need to, to do things like reduce drag. Well, the great thing about these uh, piezoelectric nanowires is you wouldn't see them, and they're scalable, and so you could apply them to a very large surface. You actuate them correctly, you could put them on airplanes, on the wings, on the fuselage. Working with nanowires is, is you can imagine, is difficult. Things are, are, are small. So what we did is we sort of scaled the experiment up. We scaled the wire surface up, we scaled the flow up, we scaled everything up. If we can look at the flow, and see how it disturbs the flow, then we can apply that on a, uh, on a nano scale. Well, it's, def it's definitely hitting the wall and yeah. doing something, right? Yeah, so I, was I was getting all the way to the top of it, so it's kind of... I always liked math. I was good at it in high school, and, uh, but I was told mathematicians, you know, didn't, uh, don't make a lot of money. It's hard to find a job, so uh, I, I was told engineering was the, the place to be. I suppose it's like asking someone why they like fruit. I don't know, you, you just sort of like it, you know. I, I, again, I think it's the mathematical nature of it. And it's the idea of posing a problem that you can then solve. That's, that's what's interesting to me about it. In my little high school, we didn't have a lot of, uh, we didn't have like vocational school or anything like that. But I knew I liked working with my hands. And I knew I liked, uh, you know, growing up building Legos and uh, connects and Erector sets and things like that. It was early on that I was like, I, I like this. I like working in a lab setting. I like, uh, you know, trying to learn new things and applying them. Uh, I guess that'd be another, you know, reason I came to research is because you, it makes you keep learning. This is the hands-on, like, build it, fly it, just have fun. I joke about it, like, this really isn't work. I don't want to say I wouldn't work in here if I wasn't paid, but probably would. <laughs> so it's just a lot of fun, you know. Always can be laying up parts or working on a mold or building a plane, so it's not sitting behind a computer. So it's just, it's great. When they, the undergrads do get their stuff together and it does fly and they do have something built and put together, you know, it's, it's a success for them, but like I also, I, I feel like I guess the success from my point of view as well, uh, just because, you know, I was down here, you know, may have been working on my own stuff, but, you know, watching them make the mistakes that I know they're going to make and then resolve them and do things like that. So, they're like a proud little papa bear. <laughs> We're actually getting stuff done, we're getting stuff built, and it's, you're not buying it and putting it together, but you're actually designing it. So your design work and spending all that time just staring at a computer is worthwhile because it is actually works, and then just when it flies, it's just something completely different. Just when I was a kid, I was always taking my stuff apart and building stuff with my dad and just like around the house with Legos and stuff. I had two huge bins full of Legos that I always just build random stuff with. I just always love working with my hands, you know, just that satisfaction of doing it yourself. And once it's done, you know, you can say that that's yours and you did it. And that was always just really rewarding to me. I've been working a lot, I actually have the plane, all the mechanical stuff finished. Um, so we actually did a test out in the engineering quad yesterday, kind of taxiing around the courtyard, just testing it out. The plane's ready to go. It's good to finally see it together and, you know, so close to flying. The 
principles of math fit into flight in the same way that the principles of math fit into many, many subjects in science. And that is that math becomes the language for which you can understand and communicate problems in flight or astronomy or biology. My name is Jesse Hogue. I'm an assistant professor in the mechanical engineering department. I was good at math and good at science, and I enjoyed both math and science. So every, a lot of people were like, oh, you should be an engineer. And I thought, all right, that sounds reasonable. Hey. Hey, have a seat. My name is BJ Wellman. I'm just finishing up my master's in mechanical engineering here at the University of Kentucky. I've always been drawn to building things, constructing things, like being able to move the world around me. I can look at something random in the world and be like, oh, this is how, this is the governing equation for it, and it just, it makes me a little happy on the inside. <laughs> okay, but I bet we can move that yeah. center just like we could in, in the other case. Yeah. So then, so the last thing to do is, after we have these five rules, we want to do examples for the paper. Control systems are everywhere in what we interact with. It's, you know, the system that causes a engineering device to operate in the way you want it to. A good example is the cruise control on your car. So one of the things I like about controls is that it, as a topic, it has lots of applications. My research is an extension of classical root locus techniques. So I first learned classical root locus in my undergraduate controls class with Dr. Hogue. Uh, when we started working with the, an extension of it, we just wanted to do that tweak with it. We wanted to figure out what happens when we have a more complicated controller. It's kind of a potentially powerful um, project in the end because root locus is a very common control technique. So one of the things we can do with with basically control systems in general, specifically with, uh, with classical root locus, is the problem called the inverted pendulum. If you've got some kind of bar that's standing straight up, you want it to stand straight up, how can I balance it? When we put it into a control system, we can have a compensator, and it tells you if you've got like a bad position right here, how do you compensate? And we can design that control system so that it'll stand straight up. You want to be able to demonstrate that the algorithm behaves in sort of a good way. It does the things you want it to do, and, it, and things that you don't want it to do don't sort of mysteriously happen. So as you said, you can do algebra to then solve your differential equations. And then what we do is we magically map back to the time domain after we've gotten our solution. It's not really magic. It's just the inverse Laplace transform. I took an undergraduate controls class, which is required by everybody, and there was a new professor, Dr. Hogue, and the way he taught, it was just, uh, it just made sense. When I first started, he was always supportive of me, and he didn't look down on me as like an undergraduate. He was just as curious as I was. It's a little tricky still. Okay. Uh, the root looks like it's proportional to k cubed. Okay. So, so you got. I so we do have that. to do. We do have to do it though, because I guess we could have a d equals one. Right? Which means the controllers exactly. One zero. Yeah. Research is always changing. It's sort of there's always something new to work on. That's the whole point of research: is never to sort of stagnate and stay in the same place. We finally have Blue Cat 1 assembled and ready to go. Today is kind of the first opportunity we have where the weather is decent. If everything goes well, we try and fly it, um, but really it's just kind of our first opportunity to get out there, test things out where we can kind of increase the speed a little bit and see how it operates. Every now and then you just gotta stop being gentle. Yeah. <laughs> Teach the point who's boss. I really want to clear tape over these, so 
<laughs> so they don't come off during flight if we do fly this thing today. So I can actually have them back to the lab to trace off. That's just sick. Close it a little more. It was pretty cold, so we had a lot of difficulty starting the engines. Um, our starters didn't work well, so we had to, you know, try and start it off for the car batteries. Hold it. Once we finally got the engine started, then we started having the wonderful problems of uh, that were curling with the actual throttle. Yeah, flip it. Just couldn't get it calibrated correctly and just, you know, that was kind of game over for the day anyway. But anyway, uh, we can get Jefferson ready to go. Yeah. So that we can actually fly something autonomously for Brandon's sake. Sounds good. Can somebody grab the Allen wrenches for this guy, get the battery out of him, get the batteries out of him, and then uh, and then uh, pull Jefferson out and like plop it somewhere in the sun. If you let yourself get down and think that you're failing, you're never gonna get whatever it is done. I mean, the reason it's research is because if it was easy, somebody else would have already done it and it wouldn't be research anymore. The Blue Cat project is one that represents students engineering and designing and building and testing an important aircraft to contribute to research. How satisfying is it to create something that hasn't been known before? We rely on just teaching others and passing down what we've learned to others so that, you know, when we're gone doing other things that it's still here and the knowledge base isn't lost. It was almost feeling like I was like handing off my firstborn child, but you know, it's also good to have somebody to pass on the knowledge to. It's been a great experience for me. Just I try and encourage as many undergrads to come in just so you know I can teach them what I know because other people did it for me. So I really want to try and give back to them. There'll always be new students and new questions and new faculty that keep the university alive and energetic and keep the research process moving. There will be different problems, there'll be new opportunities, and I think people will always be pursuing those no matter which direction they lie.